length of x-rays. So, well, uh, good for bone, but not much else really. Soft tissue, other problems, uh, not very useful. Early generation CT scans, one of the first generation CT scans. And uh, really sort of, uh, again, better than plain film x-rays, but still not great for a lot of intracranial processes or intraorbital. The ultrasound really kind of filled a gap. Um, you had, this is this one. <coughs> Minor on this, you know, is that just a... To be on the top. Yeah. Oh, not on the mouse. No, not on the mouse. Off of that. Keep going off. Make sure. Yeah, here you go. For that start. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, so then uh, these came along, of course. CTs, MRIs, incredible. Definition of soft tissue, uh, certainly in the orbit, uh, intracranially, even the globe um, uh, could show some things in the eye. So that was a big step forward. So the question kind of arose well, who needs ultrasound? We'd have that kind of technology. But there's still a role for it. There's a kind of initiative filled, certainly in the globe. I think it's still superior. You can see detail uh, yeah. fine otherwise, especially with high frequency, get the UVMs uh, really down to very micron level, but even in the orbit, there's still a role for ultrasound, and, and the A scan, all these spooky lines, uh, they actually mean something. There's a correlation to pathology. And I was doing my residency, I was impressed that you could actually sort of look at you know, cell structure, architecture, and make a correlation to all these lines. So uh, normal orbit would be like that, and then hemangioma, lymphoma, and angioma. So you almost get like tissue signatures based on pathology. So it really kind of makes you think and sort of what you're looking at. And uh, so that's still an advantage to, to using ultrasound. And of course, inside the globe, um, things like detached retinas or melanomas, things like that, uh, still a lot of usefulness. So basic principles, sound reflection from interfaces, just like lights reflected, so is sound. A lot of the same principles, Snell's, a lot of things like those are followed by ultrasound uh, reflections. So a long time ago, Bass discovered this same concept in wells. They use it in nature all the time. Uh, bass are incredible. They, they, most of them can't see. They're, they're a species that can, but they use sound to locate uh, insects and little tiny gnats and things they can pick up in the middle of the night uh, just by ultrasound. So it's a powerful technique to, to localize. And in, again, in nature, the animal kingdom, uh, humans, our range of hearing is up to about 20 kilohertz. And that's ultrasound is defined as sound above that range. So board question, if you have that on the boards, that's uh, the definition of ultrasound. So dogs can do up to about 40 kilohertz, whales dolphins 70, bats 150. So they have ability beyond our range of hearing to hear things. And then again, to use that to, uh, to localize. In medical ultrasound, uh, abdominal ultrasound, uh, commonly their frequencies are lower because the higher the frequency, the less penetration. So there's an inverse correlation. So in the abdomen, you want to get deeper into the abdomen. You want to you know, see kidneys and livers and things. So you want to be able to go penetrate deeper. So you want to keep your frequency around the one to five megahertz range. Ophthalmic, we have the advantage of having a small structure of the eye, about an inch, and then we have a lot of fluid. So ultrasound goes through fluid easily. So uh, you can get high frequencies of 60 megahertz of some of the high frequency ultrasounds to localize things. So it really gives us better resolution. Sound wave velocity. So uh, the denser the media, the faster the ultrasound velocity. Uh, water is about uh, 1480. Aqueous vitreous 1532. And that's kind of a standard setting for most biometers. Um, at least the ultrasound biometers uh, that are set for that's kind of average. So to really refine it, a lot of people will use, uh, they break it down. They'll, they'll look at the, uh, they'll break it down for the aqueous, the vitreous, and the lens, and add it to those things together in a formula to actually give the true uh, uh, distance, you know, 
know, the axial length of the eye. But if you use a standard biometer, that's kind of your average uh, setting uh, for the biometer. Okay, so principles, again, sound reflection. So the B scan is stands for brightness amplitude. So basically, you're just taking little pixels and coalescing them to make a picture. Same concept as a TV screen. Where you're just adding uh, 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 reflections to, uh, to get this uh, picture. The A scan is really the same thing as the B scan. It's just instead of a pixel or a brightness grayscale, it's actually a line. So it's just showing a line versus a dot. What's the advantage of that? I'll try to explain that to you. Then UBM stands for ultrasound biomicroscopy, which is a high frequency enter segment. It usually requires an immersion technique to see that. So this is a one formula I'll throw at you. Um, acoustic impedance equals sound velocity times density. So that's just a basic formula of physics. And in ultrasound, we depend on interfaces. So the greater the difference in impedance between two media, the higher the A scan spike or the brighter the B scan image. So when a sound uh, wave goes from one media to another, that principle applies. Your reflection, your interface reflection uh, depends on that. So to illustrate that, this is a choroidal hemangioma. So you can see the pathology there of the choroid. And these tend to be a lot of interfaces. So compared to like the vitreous, so you go into the vitreous cavity here, so the flatness on the A scan corresponds to darkness on the B scan. So there just isn't much there to reflect sound. Usually vitreous is pretty homogeneous, uh, so you don't get much reflection. So it's a flat line on the A scan. Once you hit an interface, again, this impedance principle, then you suddenly get a reflection of sound. So you go through the vitreous, you hit the interface of the, of the tumor, the surface of it, you get a high spike because you're suddenly changing that impedance concept, that velocity. And even once you're inside the tumor, there's still a lot of reflection because you have a lot of interfaces. So some tumors are very homogeneous, very dense, like melanomas. They don't give these high uh, reflections, whereas hemangiomas do. So that principle, again, starts to help you sort out pathology. You can correlate that concept to what a lesion is, both in the globe or in the orbit. So the B scan, again, is a brightness concept. So brightness on the B scan corresponds to height on the A scan. So the brighter the B scan image, the higher the A scan. But there's a limit to this. Uh, grayscale, just our ability to perceive grayscale, differentiated, is limited. So B scan lesions often look a lot the same. They might be a little bit brighter or darker based on the tumor. But A scan really kind of shows it to you, just sort of makes it stand out as uh, more uh, dramatic, more observable. So the B-scan probes, all the probes have a mark on them of some kind. You'll see a little mark on the tip of the probe. And that correlates to the transducer, which way it's going back and forth. So uh, as I teach you guys ultrasound, I always stress about you know, transverse, longitudinal, which way the mark of the thing is going. And there's a reason for that. It actually helps you orient things. And when you're looking at tumors and things to measure them, that's an important concept to have. So actually this is taking the tip off the B-scan probe and showing the transducer. So it's actually going back and forth. It's a, it's a uh, two-plane uh, uh, motion. It's, you know, it's just a, a transverse back and forth. It doesn't rotate at all. So this is going back and forth in that plane. So wherever the probe is turned, let's, let's assume the marks over here, that shows you which way the, the transducer is, is moving back and forth, oscillating back and forth. That again translates to what you're looking at inside the uh, lesion. So this transducer actually can, contains a little real thin crystal. It's a uh, used to be uh, kind of a membrane, but now it's like, like a ceramic crystal, very very thin. And that little membrane or crystal will vibrate based on electronic pulses. So the machine sends out electrical pulses. They stimulate that to vibrate, and that sends the sound wave out. So that's the basis of the uh, ultrasound uh, technology. It's actually a generation of sound by electrical pulses. So techniques, I talked about transverse longitudinal, and that's important when you're doing the V-scan to be systematic. You know, most of it's just inclined on just put the probe up there and you know, swap it on, oh, I see something, you're all excited, but you can miss things that way. You know, you be systematic just like you do with an eye exam. I probably, I have a number of cases I picked up. The other eye, it's a normal eye, the patient didn't come in for, has the pathology. 
we have several melanomas that were the other eye versus the eye that they came in for. So just always, I'll just look at both and do systematic exams. And look at the whole eye. Like you're missing, you just focus on one element of it. So again, the concept, so the markers here, that means the transducer is going back and forth, kind of out of the plane of the slide here. It's going to be towards us, back into the, the slide. So that's transverse view. And as that beam is oscillating back and forth, that is showing the lateral extent of the lesion. So if you had a lesion here, you're kind of going lateral, uh, uh, examining it. If you turn the probe this way, where the marker is up, the transducer is then going like that. So this is a parallel to the limbus. If we define it as a transverse view. So when the transducer is moving parallel to the limbus, that is called transverse. When you're longitudinal like that, uh, when perpendicular to it, that's called longitudinal. And that shows anterior to posterior extent of the lesion. So the beam is actually going this way. It's going from the uh, optic nerve up to the aura in that direction. So each sweep of the B scan probe is about 60 degrees. So if you want to scan the whole globe, that requires six different sections. You get 360. So anyway, so that concept of, of a transverse, longitudinal, this is an axial where you're actually putting right on the cornea, going back right to the back of the eye. So those are the three basic probe positions that we use. So an axial scan, uh, you can see uh, the probe is up here. You can sort of see a little bit of maybe the posterior lens capsule. You miss most of the anterior segment because uh, <coughs> the physics of the probe, the way it works, you lose information up in here because you're touching the, the, the globe. As you go through the lens here, uh, optic nerve shadow, kind of the shadow in the back, that's the optic nerve. So you, you could use that for a view. The problem with the axial view is I don't use it a lot is because first of all, patients just don't like around the cornea. You're always kind of worried about corneal abrasions and things. And then also you lose energy, sound energy. As you're going through the lens, it absorbs some of the sound energy. So you don't see as well, the resolution is not as good. So. We often don't use axial views unless there's something right in the, in the immediate uh, back of the eye. So we often use just, uh, just off the limbus to see things. So again, the transverse uh, B scan versus longitudinal. So again, transverse uh, is going this way. The uh, transducer is rotating back and forth out of the plane of the slide. And this is going perpendicular or longitudinal. And we can characterize the lesions that way. This is a lesion, there's a lump in the eye here, so you want to examine it. So this is uh, what kind of a, tra a transfer scan here. So we're kind of looking here at the lateral extension of the lesion, so we can measure the, so when you see the lesion, uh, the marker uh, on the probe tells you on the screen which way is up. So it's always uh, the way the, the equipment is made, it displays the image uh, with the, uh, where the white mark is that is up on the screen. So this would be the superior part of the lesion. This would be the inferior part. And longitudinal, again, you're going this way. You're going perpendicular to the limbus, back and forth that way. So you see the lesion there, the uh, kind of the uh, anterior posterior extension of the lesion versus lateral. So there's the optic nerve, there's the lesion. So um, this is the lesion here nasally. So what kind of view is that, the way the probe is oriented there? It's not here transverse, I launch a tunnel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is a transverse view because you're parallel to the limbus. Think about the transducer moving, limbus is here, so you're moving that way, and so you're parallel to the limbus, which would be a transfer view. So that lesion is seen that way. You rotate the probe this way, where you're going perpendicular. Okay, does that make sense? So it's perpendicular here, so your transverse is going that way. So that shows a lesion in those views. So putting these all together, you have to kind of mentally construct this. Uh, you can actually see the lesion. You can see the, the uh, both lateral extension and anterior posterior. And that's important because when we measure these lesions, uh, it's very common now to treat melanomas with radioactive plaques. So you actually make a plaque, radioactive iodine, show it to the eye on the sclera, leave it there for three days, then take it off. And so you need to know how to make the plaque. So you have to have these measurements, and I'd see a patient referred by an ocular oncologist. I need to tell them the uh, lateral and anterior posterior extension. So those are really important measurements. 
then we follow lesions, either we're going to before we treat them or after they've been treated, just to follow see if they responded. Again, you need to be consistent, reproducible, systematic. So these are all important to do that. So it's just good to think, you know, think that way and kind of think systematically. So that's the B scan concept, the A scan. Uh, the transducer in the A scan is not sweeping back and forth. It's a fixed beam, it's just a sound beam that comes out, so you don't have to worry about probe position. Then there's no mark on the A scan wherever you put it. It's the beam is the same, it just comes out of the probe as a cone. So the A scan is placed on the globe. You get the initial spike from the surface of the eye itself. And again, this area is kind of an area of lost information. Whatever is in there, you really can't see because of the physics of the probe. This, this the velocity of sound coming back and the crystal stimulation. Uh, that area is about three to five millimeters. So your anterior sclera, anterior vitreous, that's all in there somewhere. You don't really know what it is. The same on the B scan. You go through the uh, vitreous, again, it's mostly homogeneous. So as the beam goes through, you don't get much reflection of sound because it's homogeneous. And then you hit the surface of the tumor. Jesus concept change in velocity, suddenly so get a spike. And once you're inside the tumor, melanomas tend to be rather homogeneous, they're intensely cellular. You don't get as many interfaces as you do with other lesions. So that's important that kind of <coughs> distinguish a melanoma from other things. That reflectivity, so it's kind of on the low to medium side. It's kind of regular, there are you know, little ups and downs, but it's not huge difference in, in variance there. Again, so based on pathology, if you look at the pathology of a melanoma, that kind of makes sense why you see that pattern. Then you hit the sclera, again, another change in. Uh, sound velocity, you get a spike of the sclera, and back in the orbit, the orbit has a lot of interfaces. You have fat, septa, muscles, nerves, so the orbit is uh, high reflective versus the vitreous, which is low reflective. Do you, can you see the choroid on that? On uh, the choroid? Yeah. yeah. You can actually, uh, if you look at the, turn the, uh, the frequency, the gain down a little bit, you can actually separate out the choroid from the retina. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not as accurate as OCT. You know, <laughs> so I actually use this picture to kind of, that's a good analogy now. If we do these OCTs, which we're used to, like macular OCT, this is kind of the B scan. You're looking kind of closely, you're looking at the back of the eye, the poster segment with the B scan, just envision the B scan signal showing the, uh, the retina surface, and you're looking here at the macula. This is the A scan. So the A scan, an ultrasound, actually you take a section through that, you know, as you move this, uh, green line, the cursor as you sweep it, different parts, it actually shows you those sections. And that's what the A scan is doing. It's actually the B scan is showing the kind of a big image. The A scan is taking like a cross section through that, kind of like a needle biopsy versus a gross pass specimen. Does that kind of make sense? So they do complement each other. I use them a lot. I use, most patients I see, I use both, A and B scan. So again, here's melanoma, the pathology. Very densely cellular, just a lot of cells packed together. There's a few blood vessels, so you get a few reflections from that, but usually they're pretty low. So here's going through the vitreous, here's a spike of the tumor, here's inside the lesion, here's a sclera, here's the orbit. So you can see again that uh, there's just uh, a lot of dense uh, cells packed together. So some interfaces, but not real high, uh, not real irregular. Uh, the B scan shows the brightness. This is subretinal fluid. The retina is being pushed off here. But here's the lesion. But again, you know, to look at this, um, that could be a lot of things. That could be hemangioma, that could be metastatic. So the B scan is really, it shows you there's a lesion there. It shows you kind of the general size and shape, so kind of morphology. But to really define it, the A scan is a needle biopsy concept. You're going through the lesion, looking inside, what does the structure look like? And that correlates to pathology. So. That was the neat thing about ultrasound that first kind of attracted me to it. So the A-scan probe has kind of this pencil-like probe. And again, there's not a mark on it. There's not a transducer going back and forth. There's just a, a beam coming out. And there's some confusion about this. If you ever buy an ultrasound machine, if you go to a company and they say, do you have A-scan? Yeah, I have A-scan. And you buy it. It really isn't. They, they kind of equate A-scan as biometry. If you look at a biometry probe on the ultrasound machine, it kind of looks like that. Like we go to use a VA's machine all the time, the text will hook up the A-scan. I have to kind of switch probes because the A-scan probe that gets for biometry is not the same as we use for diagnostic A-scan. They're not, they're not interchangeable. I, I can use this to do biometry. I can't use the biometry probe to do kind of what I do with tumors and things. So 
that's a source of confusion. Even a reps and sell machine will just tell you, I, I, yeah, look at A scan. It's not the same thing. And a lot of machines on the B scan uh, image, they have a little thing you can turn and see a little A scan pattern at the bottom, like a vector A scan. Is just, there's a line you can sweep through and see the lesion, and you'll see the A scan at the bottom. That isn't a true A scan. That's just kind of taken from the B scan envelope. And I just sort of use that information to make sort of an A scan out of the B scan information. But it's not a freestanding separate A scan. <laughs> to really do an A scan uh, accurately, you need to have a separate dedicated probe with a separate module on the machine. So returning echo, just again, just like light, these are all things that light does, and ultrasound does too. So sound is absorbed by things. So I mentioned the axle view with the lens absorbing sound, reflection, how you hold the probe angle of incidence, Snell's law, interfaces, size, shape, smoothness. These will all affect the image that you see on the ultrasound. Example here of a little tumor. So here's going through the vitreous. Here's a lesion here with the first arrow. It's clear the second arrow. So you're inside the lesion. It's kind of small. Smaller lesions are harder to distinguish. It's probably a small melanoma because it's kind of low reflective. It could be something else. But um, Anyway, the point of this is to show you, I'm perpendicular here, you get a nice high rising spike. I always stress that when you guys are doing ultrasound with me with A scan. I'm going to get this initial spike high rising. You don't want to get it kind of you know, bumpy or off axis. And this is the same lesion just by turning the probe purposefully obliquely. I'm not perpendicular here, I'm oblique to it. But you see that by doing that, you don't get that nice high spike at the first. And internal reflectivity is less distinguishable. It looks kind of maybe medium to low here. Here it's sort of based on the initial spike, it's probably higher or irregular. So that bleakness just kind of clouds the internal information. So that's why being perpendicular is important. And people that do axial length measurements, the techs that do that, always know you gotta be perpendicular to really get correct axial length measurements. So it's important to get, and you know you're perpendicular based on the initial spike. If it's very high, if it's smooth, and a lot of bumps in it, that means you're perpendicular. Uh, hand eye concept as you do it, you're watching the screen, moving your hand back and forth, trying to maximize that initial signal. So, indications uh, for ultrasound of the globe, opaque media, obviously very important, you know, dense cataract, cloudy cornea, vitreous hemorrhage, these are all things that we do all the time to use ultrasound for. Visible fundus lesions, you can see the lesion, but what is it? Uh, you know, we think we're good at it, but even the experts, uh, the Shields group, inaccurate uh, diagnoses of lesions based on uh, a lot of past studies. So just looking at a lesion, the direct ophthalmoscopy, as good as it is, uh, a lot of time we're, we're fooled by how lesions look. Biometry, axial length, even though we have IOL master, we have the, you know, the light-based uh, measurements, uh, about 20% of the time they still need to use, use ultrasound. I mean, the techs all the time have to go to immersion ultrasound to see to be able to go through dense cataracts, so dense mature cataracts, PSC cataracts, a lot of things can give uh, spurious measurements on the IOL master. So measuring axial length, uh, intraocular structures, measuring high tumor height, things like that, that's critical. I do a lot of that. A lot of the patients I see are referred from the local groups here that do uh, ocular oncology. And I'm measuring all the time. I'm measuring before treatment, I'm measuring after. So a lot of what I do is, is based on uh, accurate measurements. And the A scan is really more important. Retroidal pathology, optic dystabromalics, these are kind of major indications for ultrasound. So opaque media, um, looking behind through dense cataracts. I think it's standard of care, that's almost malpractice if you do a cataract surgery without an ultrasound before, uh, just to you know, see what's going on inside the eye. And uh, I've seen a number of cases that things were missed, even including tumors. It's not a good idea to do surgery on it with the tumor in it. There's always a concern about spread. So I really think it's important to do an ultrasound. And biometry doesn't count. You can miss, you can do biometry and measure the eye. You have a big tumor sitting there and you don't see it with biometry. So you gotta do either dedicated uh, A or B scan or both. I just looked at a study in my own practice. I looked at a thousand patients over a couple of years. I just found this, the clinical impression a patient referred to me for a diagnosis. Let's say that they said there's a vitreous hemorrhage or there's a detached retina. I confirmed that in uh, 400 of them. So um, clinical diagnosis was confirmed. 
I couldn't find uh, anything in about 279. So patients sent for eye pain, common reason, my eye hurts, aches, you know, you do the ultrasound, you really don't find much going on to explain it. Uh, clinical impression clarified or altered in about a third. Um, so this meant that they were sent in for something like a vitreous hemorrhage, and I found a detached red under the hemorrhage or a tumor or something. So I changed the diagnosis or I added to it. <coughs> the correct diagnosis of five. So this is kind of just an overview of an ultrasound practice where I see a thousand patients and kind of breaks down. Uh, so the value of it is, you're getting a third of these patients, you're finding things that the doctor didn't know was there to start with. So that's, that's pretty important. And again, with the patients with opaque media, about a third of the methodology not suspected by the referring doctor. Okay, visible fundus lesions, again, not that great. You, know, you can sort of tell sometimes looking at a lesion what you think it is. But uh, two large past studies, AFIP, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, back in the 60s and 70s, two different separate studies looked at this. And they found, in those days, nucleation was very common for eyes with tumors. That was kind of standard of care. You saw a tumor in the eye, and often they were nucleated within a week or so. Radiation plaques weren't really being used yet or anything. So. Uh, nucleation was pretty common, so a lot of eyes were sent to the pathology people. And by looking at all these eyes, they found that 20% of the eyes had a false positive diagnosis of melanoma. So that means 20% of eyes were taken out that didn't have to be there, benign lesions, often 20 20 eyes or so. So you know, that's, that's not great uh, figures. And so to look at a lesion, it's hard to tell sometimes. This, act, this in fact, was a nebus, this was a melanoma, but just to look, just the criteria we go by. Sometimes it's just not that obvious by looking at them. Biometry axial length, I mentioned that. So we use immersion techniques to do the uh, biometry. We have to do that to uh, be able to see the front structures of the eye. So if you put the probe right against the cornea, you lose information. You would have the cornea buried in there. You'd have the anterior chamber of the anterior lens. So you wouldn't be able to see that. To be able to stand the probe back, you have to use some kind of a, inter a liquid interface to put the probe in and you get the uh, spike from the, the probe itself. You get the, uh, going through the, the uh, scleral shell here. Then you hit the cornea right there, uh, anterior chamber, lens, anterior posterior lens, vitreous and retina. So you can actually break it down and you can then use that to measure, electronic calipers to measure front to back of eye. And again, about 20% of the cases here, the text tell me they have to end up doing immersion ultrasound. Measuring endocrine structures, I mentioned this, following tumors for growth. So here's a little small melanoma. So here is a lesion. About a year later, it looked kind of the same on a B scan. I haven't really seen the change a lot. But the A scan, the actual thickness of it had changed slightly. But a big difference was reflectivity patterns. Here it is initially kind of high, probably like a nevus. It's getting lower here. It's getting lower reflectivity, more regular. That's conversion from a nevus to melanoma. And I see this a number of times. You follow a lesion, that's what we do ultrasound on nevi because some of these will start to change. You want to get baseline measurements and then follow over time and see if it's changing. Again, size wasn't all that much different, but reflectivity internally was, so that really clued us this was starting to convert. And the idea is of the conversion rate of nevi to melanoma. So, so nevi in the population, rough guess how many people have nevi? Five percent? Higher? The numbers are kind of varied. It used to be six percent. Now, kind of the current literature says about eight. So in this group, probably somebody has a nevus in there with you guys. So about eight percent. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, <laughs> Mike's pointing to her. <laughs> anyway, so about eight percent have nevi, and at that group, rough guess how many convert to melanoma over time? Two, five. One. One. So, about one in 10,000. So what's that, point zero 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 one. So it's pretty pretty unlikely, but it can happen. So again, that's why we follow them, but the odds of that are, are not very high, but still, it can happen. So vitreoretin pathology, um, very important for like vitreous hemorrhage you can't see inside the eye. So the classic uh, kind of a Optic, optic disc with a, with a high reflective membrane of the optic disc. 
that's consistent with attached retina. You always suspect that. The vitreous membrane sometimes will do that, so it's not 100%, but the A scan is helpful in these cases if you're not quite sure. You see a membrane on B scan, you can do the A scan, and you, you look for a high, high spike, smooth reflection. That's pretty suggestive of detached retina. If it doesn't get that high, if it's just kind of down here somewhere, more likely a vitreous membrane. So I use that a lot in these kind of hard cases. You're not quite sure if it's a, a vitreous membrane versus a detached retina. Show some videos. These are little video clips of just showing some motion, some kinetics. So I'll show that. I have a separate uh, little video clip I'll show you that's showing just the motion of, of different uh, membranes inside the eye. So this is a case, there's a small tumor here. Don't worry about that. It's more I'm trying to show the motion. This is a bit <laughs> story. Don't worry. So uh, when you see the kinetics of it, you just see a lot of fluidity. It's kind of just flowing as the eye moves. That's consistent with hemorrhage. This is another tumor, but over that is a membrane. This is the detached retina. There's kind of a stiff motion as the eye moves. It just sort of just stiff. It's not a real fluid, undulating kind of motion. Another one, this is a small tumor, but this again is the retina over a very stiff motion compared to vitreous, a lot of fluidity, so I'll show that in a minute here. And this is the same thing again here. So kinetics are important, showing how motion is. I watch, I do that a lot when I do the V-scan especially, it's just to see how things move and that kind of helps sort out membranes versus other things. Disc. See a lot of these, you know, you have the patient with a funny looking disc. And uh, yeah. two ways to go. They're either the central neurologist and they get an MRI, CT, spinal tap, angiogram, everything you can think of. $25,000 workup uh, versus do an ultrasound, a couple hundred bucks, two minutes. And you see this, you know, optic disc bruising, very common. But it can be deceiving. Sometimes even the neuroophthalmologist kind of scratch their heads, they look. This is the case here, showing this disc, funny looking disc. This is pretty suggestive of Jerusalem. If you look at this very carefully with the 90 diopter, you can see kind of bumpy, lumpy, kind of glistening areas. So that, you would think bruising in that situation, which is verified on the ultrasound, but it was. But here's not so obvious. That's pretty scary looking. Looks kind of like papilledema. You saw that kind of, you know, bats and vascular congestion, kind of uh, very prominent optic disc. But yeah, this is a large, very Jerusalem. Same thing here, kind of looks like papilledema, again, big optic nerve bruising. So, so optic disc bruising, any, any guesses on the uh, frequency of these? How many people in the population have optic disc bruising? Mm -hmm. Tim? Okay, a little lower? Three. Yeah, two to three. That's sort of based on past studies. So genetics of it, are they genetically uh, inherited trait? Recessive, dominant? sex link, probably dominant with uh, with mixed penetrance. So we've done some genetic study. We used to haul our equipment out to family reunions, Dr. Katz and I, and take our ultrasound equipment, <laughs> blood, and have potato salad with the cousins and the uncles and the aunts, <laughs> take everybody. And we found, usually in a family, if you find somebody with it, there's a pretty good chance of finding somebody somewhere that has it. It's not always the parents or direct relatives, but an uncle or a cousin, somebody has it. So we haven't found the gene yet. We're still looking for it. Just like Nico's looking, I guess you're looking for your gene for the tumor. Who gave the talk at residence day? Um, maybe that was? Uh, oh, that's right, that's right. Looking for the gene, <laughs> yeah. So we're doing the same thing for gene hunters. I think we found a family, we found a family a month ago. It's a mother and both kids had them. 
So I, that's got to be a change in touch now. Get glad about it and we're going to look for it. So this is a case that wasn't Drew's, and this had you know, kind of a swollen looking nerve. And then here's the ultrasound showing the kind of the elevation, but there wasn't a brightness, like that bright lump you see like a, a calcified drusen. And here's the ACE scan can be helpful. I usually do ACE scans on most of these patients just to see. But here's the optic nerve from there to there. So that's the one sheath, that's one sheath. And then here, if you do what's called a 30 degree test, you, you measure the patient looking straight ahead, and you have an abduct the eye 30 degrees. And the theory is that you abduct the eye, you sort of squish the nerve, you sort of stretch it, and if there's fluid, you sort of push the fluid back so the nerve thins. So the concept is you get a thinner nerve by doing this test. That's called the 30 degree test. So looking straight ahead, here was the nerve, 30 degree test here, you can see it's thinner. It reduced about 50%. That's a positive test. So if I see that, that means there's fluid around the nerve, increased optic nerve fluid, which goes along with increased intracranial pressure. So pseudotumor cerebri, things like that. Whereas a solid lesion like a glioma, meningioma, would not do that. The nerve would not thin as you, as you move it, it because it's a solid uh, lesion. So the nerve has stayed the same. So it kind of differentiates fluid around the nerve versus like a tumor of the nerve. So that's an important test to know about. Case here, this is a central red artery occlusion. See the cherry red spot. And kind of called boxcar and you actually watch the, the uh, blood come pumping the blood vessels inside the artery. You ever seen that anybody? Ever seen central artery occlusion with boxcar? Okay. Mm -hmm. And the fluorescent shows it. You'll see this kind of clumps of red cells that they kind of pump along because they're just, you know, stagnant, not moving. This was a patient that we saw as like a late Friday night uh, gentleman that had sudden loss of vision. And so, again, I mentioned this, I think, in my talk, ran as it uh, you can see kind of a brightness here. That's actually an embolus. So you can actually, about a third of these patients with central artery occlusions, you can find an embolus on the B scan. So it's easy to do, you just put the probe up there, look real quick for the nerve, it takes 10 seconds. If you see that, you know it's embolic. And that's important, you get an older patient, sudden loss of vision, that could be janssen arteritis. So how do you know the difference? Um, so this can help you, along with Mike and I study on <laughs> another way to look at it. And this is a drusen. It shows the drusen are different. They're more anterior. They're anterior to the lamina cribosa, whereas emboli are posterior to it. So it's further back. So it's not the same as the drusen. But if you see that, you know, it's symbolic. You got to, you know, your job is to find the source of the emboli, but it really helps. You know, that Friday night special where you don't know what's going on, but it redirects you what to do. This patient had uh, blockage of the uh, carotid artery with, with emboli, emboli coming up to at the uh, central artery. This is orbital cover Doppler, which um, I use some. Again, we're doing the study with uh, temporal art arteries with Mike and I. But, um, this is a machine. Uh, we don't have one here, but we have one in the, in the vascular lab. We kind of borrow theirs and push it back and forth. The Doppler concept is based on movement. So it's still ultrasound, but it's moving things. So as the thing moves, it changes the frequency. If you ever stood on a train track and heard the train coming towards you and hear the whistle and as it goes away, it just changes pitch or changes frequency. So that's the Doppler concept. Used in space to help with tele, you know, the whole concept of galaxies, the Big Bang receding from us, so blue shift versus red shift. So you can use it for different things, blood flow to the globe, emboli detection, as I mentioned, orbital venous flow, tumor vasculature, these are all things we use. This just shows a normal Doppler. So here's the, authentic, here's the globe up here. So you're behind the globe here, the optic nerve shot would be kind of in here. Ophthalmic artery, and then the feeder into the central retinal artery, which you kind of get a part of it here, and then more of it here. So central retinal artery, central retinal vein. These are the celery body, uh, celery artery, uh, culture celery, anterior celery arteries. So this is a normal color Doppler, how it looks. Uh, obviously all the blood flow patterns. And this is like a hemi occlusion, had a hemi central artery occlusion. So you can see this part is just dead, just blood flow is gone, whereas this part is still being vascularized. Yeah. Maybe. With that, how do you know that you're not just catching things occlusion? I guess you have the optic nerve shadow. Kind of yeah, the optic nerve shadow helps you, you know, it kind of gives you orientation. Yeah. And then different views. That's a good question. If you ever see something, 
to verify, you have to have just different views of it. You sort of move the probe different directions and be sure it still is, is the same. I've seen, I reviewed papers that said they had roots and they didn't because they were just looking in one section. It kind of caught an artifact, and if you move the probe differently, it goes away. So, whereas trees and don't. This is a giant cell arteritis, and they're just devastating. That's why they're so bad. When you lose vision from giant cell arteritis. They're, they're gone. They're just, they wipe out everything. The blood flow is just gone. Ophthalmic artery, central open artery. So it's just a dead orbit. So you know, it's just that's why it's so terrible to get giant cell arteritis. And then the danger is losing the vision in the other eye. Forty percent will go blind in the other eye within a couple of weeks. So it's, that's why it's so critical to make the diagnosis and institute proper therapy. So I am below emboli, so you can see them they're further back. So here's the optic disc up here. This is back behind it, behind the lamina. So the little brightness is consistent with emboli. Orbital venous flow, this is a normal pure ophthalmic vein. So it's kind of thin, just kind of bluish. So in the Doppler, this is programmed to show venous flow as blue and arterial flow as red, just because that's what we're used to. We think of arteries as red, veins as blue. This is a case, came in, kind of you know, a lot of vascular congestion, these tortuous vessels. Um, patient kind of had aching around the eye, um, kind of at night when they were sleeping, they heard kind of a wish in their head, so the kind of a classic, you know, sort of think of a fistula. But this confirms it. This is the vein, and very dilated, arterialized. The, the flow is not venous, it's not blue, it's red because the arterial flow is going through the vein, it's reverse flow. So that's why the pressure builds up and they're so congested. So this is, you know, shows it pretty rapidly. Tumor vasculature, you can look at tumors inside vessels in you know, the temporal artery. So again, from our study showing kind of a normal, this is a temporal artery. This is a, a long section. This is a cross section. And so the artery wall compared to here, see this kind of a loosency around the wall. That's because of edema, inflammation. So you get this called halo sign, where it's a halo around the, instead of being right around it, it's dark, echo lucency, consistent with that. So that's what we're looking at right now. We appreciate the patients. We're seeing patients probably got about one, nine or 10 now, I think we're up to, so yeah. yeah. So appreciate the referrals. This is a melanoma, again, showing vessels inside that. I can actually see vasculature without Doppler on melanomas. I can see real time, it's a real time uh, exam. So I can actually see the flow and I'll try to show that to you here in a second. And then the high frequency, in my days at UCLA, we used to do this. We drape the patient with all these drapes, fill with water, give them a scuba mask to snorkel because they hated it because they went in the water. That's how we did these immersion scans. But now we're a lot gentler and kinder with these immersion shells and things that we use just to make it easier. So 20 megahertz, this is a case of a dictyoma, medulopathyoma, epithelioma in a girl. So she had this lesion kind of up here on the uh, contact B scan, kind of real peripheral, hard to see it, with an immersion scan. So here's the shell up here, corneas up here, here's iris. That's a lesion right behind the iris, kind of in the ciliary body. So you can just see it a lot better by doing an immersion scan, backing the probe off and seeing the end in the front of the eye. 50 megahertz, that's kind of what we use routinely to see real high frequency. You can see the cornea, iris, anterior lens. You see zonules here, ciliary body, so it just shows incredible anatomy. Here's a cyst. These are pretty common. We see a lot of, you know, we see an iris kind of bulging. It's always good to do an ultrasound to be sure it's not a tumor. Um, you can see a big cyst here, not a small part of one here, so these are pretty common. Here's a case we saw with Dr. Vitale a while ago. So here's a patient had kind of cataract surgery, kind of chronic uh, recurrent end up uh, uveitis. They kind of get flare up. They treat them with steroids, kind of quiet down over about a year. These kind of kept coming. So I find the UVM. So the cornea is up here. Here's the iris. Here's the IOL. You see this clump of stuff on the IOL? That's actually bacteria growing. There's a vegetation on the IOL. So this is P acne it's actually showing on the IOL. So this patient had to have the lens removed, the caps removed, all that just to clear it out and treat them. Another case here this is an UG syndrome. So uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema. So here's the iris. Here's the uh, IOL optic. 
the object and here's the haptic. And as you follow it out, it actually gets right against the iris and rubs against it. So you get this chronic irritation called the UGG syndrome. This just shows you can see uh, different things in the astro segment. Even with the 10 megahertz Pro, if you don't have a high frequency UVM, you can still use the 10 megahertz, the standard Pro. So here's a case of an iris cyst right there with 10 megahertz. Here's a 20, here's a 50. So you can see it better, obviously, with higher resolution, but you can still see it with a lower resolution. So you can still, you know, if you don't have access to it, you can still use that to look at anterior segment stuff with, with immersion techniques. Kind of comparing OCT to UVM, OCT is great in the anterior chamber, but it's not so great behind the iris. You really just light pace, you can't get really behind the iris. So here's a patient with a tumor here, kind of a bulge in the iris on OCT, but you can define it much better with the uh, UVM. So these are all examples of that, just showing just down the board here, that UVM is superior to that area. So celery body, sulcas, anything behind the iris in the anterior segment, you're better to get a UVM and an OCT. And more examples here. Okay, so that is a sort of an overview of ultrasound. I don't know if I can show this video. So it doesn't translate very well to PC. Let me see if I can. I should have a way to hook up the Mac. Well, it might be just this little security setting. Oh, right. Pops so. up. This shows kinetics. This is a, a vitreous hemorrhage. You can see the fluidity of it here. And yeah, it could be a detached retina there, but again, yeah, it's so mobile, so fluid doesn't really attach to the optic disc. You can see how it moves, how it flows. So that's an example showing the kinetics. The, the very, very corner. The red one. Top, the top right. right here. This shows vascularity. So this is a melanoma here. You see that little flicker inside of it? This is rapid little flicker. That's blood flow. So if you see that, I'm always, I'm always looking for that whenever I see a tumor. Because a lot of tumors don't have that. Hemangiomas don't at all because they're a slow, venous, stagnant flow. Um, a lot of things don't. Blood, but you just can't catch it it's not fast yeah, basically. Yeah, it's just not that fast arterial flow. And the same thing with like a capillary hemangioma in a baby with heavies, you know, heavies bumps on around their eyelids and things. You can see the blood flow with these, so it's very helpful to see that, see that rapid flicker. You all see that? It's appreciated the motion. The A-scan can show it too, so here's the lesion here, and see that inside of it, everything's kind of moving, but there's such a real rapid independent motion inside that thing, which A-scan can I'll show it, demonstrate the vascular. I think B scan's better, it's easier to see it. It's another melanoma, kind of a mushroom. Again, little rapid flickers inside of it.
there was that case I was trying to show. Here's a melanoma, but you can see the blood over it. So here's subhyaline hemorrhage. And as the eye moves, it just kind of swishes. It just sort of flows really mm -hmm. easily compared to the stiff motion of a detached retina. Here's the tumor, but this see that's the memory over. That's a detached retina. See how stiff it is. This is not that undulated, really um, easy motion. Okay. That was thought to be a tumor. I first looked at it, and off the eye moved, rolled across the back of the eye. So it was a dislocated eye. True cataract, but dislocated. I think that's probably maybe one more vitreous. Again, showing the vitreous, the hemorrhage, and then the vitreous, the posterior hyaline phase, just a lot of fluid. Okay, so that's it. Ultrasound. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. I'm happy to spend time with you guys and everyone. <coughs>